Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Today we're going to go wild with Alex Kearns. Yes, you are tuned into Seven Essential Factors to Elevate Your Animal Portraits, hosted by Tamron USA. So a huge thank you to Tamron for hosting today's event. And a warm welcome to Alex Kearns, who's joining us for more than just a hop, skip, and a jump away. You're like a hop, skip, jump, three planes, six trains, and halfway across the world. So Alex, what's going on? Oh, yeah. I'm coming to you from the future. And when you guys get here, it's great. You're going to love it. It's amazing. Tell me every team that won. It's going to be like a like episode of Back to the Future. <laughs> the Almanac. I want the Almanac. But no, Alex, it's great to have you on. I know the last time we had you in the event space, it was actually the physical event space over there at the Superstore. So this is a nice welcome to our little virtual world that we have built here. And I, I will remind everybody that uh, any questions you have, don't wait until the end. We will be doing Q&A at the end. But if you have a question, throw it in the, the chat. If you're joining us here on uh, Zoom, throw it in the q and If you're joining us on the far expanses of the internet, you can drop it in the comments section. We'll make sure that we get it asked to Alex. But Alex, show is yours. I'm going to kick it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to do a quick screen share so you can get everything up and running. And let's go. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. Like I said, I'm coming to you from Thursday morning. It's nice and early here, but it's totally worth it to uh, get up and be with you guys. And I'm going to share today, I think these are more uh, kind of skill sets that I think that you need to take better animal portraits. So uh, there's seven factors, obviously, that we're going to discuss. And as mentioned, this uh, webinar is proudly presented by Tamron Americas, and I'm very grateful for their support uh, in arranging this for me as well. So firstly, I'm just going to share a little bit about me. Obviously, I talk funny, so I'm based in Australia, uh, down under, and it is about, uh, for me to get to America, it's about a 25-hour trip to, in total and two flights. Uh, 30 years ago, I was a police officer with the West Australian Police Service, and that's me there, uh, bottom left. This was a, a kind of fundraising photo we did for the newspaper for Red Nose Day, which raised money for babies who passed away from sudden infant death syndrome. So that was my life for about 14 years. Then after that career finished, I spent five years auditing airports and airlines for their counter-terrorist security measures. So I pretty much had a 19-year government career to do with audit, compliance, enforcement, rules, regulations. And now I just hug on puppies and I get to travel the world. So I get goosebumps when I say that because this is a much nicer life than I had before. And this is much, much you know, I guess if I had a choice, this is where I'd prefer to be totally. I still get some people who ask me, do I miss that previous life? And obviously the answer is no, I do not miss it for one minute. I love what I get to do. Nowadays, my life is defined by images. So I live, breathe and see images. I think you guys would have that too. When you've got a camera in your hand, you your eyes are open and you're noticing things that you wouldn't normally probably stop and look at little ways that little bits of you know moisture on a leaf glistens in the light or you know the way something shines you know over off to the side or the colors and patterns in something so I love that photography gives us the gift of seeing everything in images even if we don't take that photo we still see it and we notice more when we're out and about in the world my last trip to Bali pre-pandemic uh, these were some of the photos I took so Bali for me is a three and a half hour flight north it's quicker for me to go to Bali than to go to the capital city in Australia, which is um, on the other side of the country in Canberra. So this is a photo of some geese, just some random geese in a rice paddy field. I also took a photo of a baby monkey having a drink. And I took a picture of two monkeys playing by face. There was also a picture of a rooster, but I didn't want to bore you guys this early in with all the pictures of roosters. So three photos from my, my Bali trip. When I came home from Bali and my friend said, these are great, nice photos of geese, of monkey and some other monkeys. Well, yeah. And I probably showed them the rooster too because um, I might want to see it. Uh, where, where did you stay? What, what villa were you in? Did you go to a restaurant? Did you go in a swimming pool? What was the beach like? I'm like, yeah, I don't take photos of that. I literally just focus on animals. So this is literally a true representation of my last trip to Bali. Yeah, I stayed in a villa. I went to restaurants. I swam in a pool. I went to the beach. They didn't take any pictures of that because it's just not my lane. I stick very closely to my genre. And unless there's an animal in the scene, I generally don't pick up my camera. So a little bit about me. I always get a bit awkward reading things out about myself. I'll let you guys have a quick skim of that. 
Um, it's easier when someone else talks about you than for you to talk about yourself, I find. But I've been a pro photographer now for about 15 years. I photograph pets and wildlife in a studio, and I photograph wildlife outdoors using natural light. So I don't photograph pets outdoors, but I do everything I can in the studio. I've won a few prizes, I uh, have a few books, I work with lots of different brands. I have some calendar and greeting card deals. Um, and I've been very blessed to be an ambassador for a number of brands, obviously, including Tamron lenses. So every photograph in this presentation was shot with the Tamron lens, and I've been using their lenses now for a decade. And so uh, anyone has any questions about lenses or what lens should I use, please feel free to drop it in the chat as well, and I'll cover those at the end. Why did I choose animals? I kind of mentioned this already. To be honest, they chose me. I bought my first DSLR camera. It cost $300. It was a very basic entry-level camera. And I thought, this is going to be easy. I'm going to photograph everything. This photography thing is going to be a piece of cake. And I realized pretty quickly, for me, it wasn't easy. And if there were animals around, that's what I gravitated towards. So eventually, I was at the park with a friend and my friend's small child. And the little girl was saying, I do ballet. And she had a ribbon. She was saying, watch me spin. And while she was spinning, I was meant to be taking family portraits of her spinning around. I saw a duck fly past. And I said, I'll oh, just keep spinning over there. So while she was spinning around and couldn't see me, I started photographing the duck. And when I got home, I had more photos of the duck than I did of the spinning child. And I kind of realised then, mm, didn't really do my job, firstly. And secondly, that was what I wanted to focus on. So that became the natural focus on my lens. And honestly, people say to me, why animals? I'm like, absolutely, why not? If they're not one of the absolute most amazing best things to photograph, I don't know what is. So through my photography, I have two very clear goals. Every photo I take has to fit both or one of these goals. So the first aim is to showcase the beauty of animals through images. When I take a picture, I want to show that animal in a positive, happy, colourful light. There's enough negative stuff out there that we can find if we want to dig hard enough. I'm sure it pops up in social media feeds all the time about the realities of how some animals are treated. I've seen it myself with my own eyes, but I don't want that with my images. I want to show the dog that's been recovered from a horrific situation and is happy and healthy and use that to educate people about, you know, maybe the plight of animals that aren't, you know, as loved as they should be. And then from my images, I want to support, promote, and endorse animal rescue. That's just something that I've always had as an intrinsic belief in my business. If I'm making money off people, you know, by photographing their pets and essentially making money off those animals, I should give back to animals in need uh, as well. So I have a very strong um, slant towards animal rescue and supporting animal rescue, doing different projects, raising funds, raising awareness. You know, if they need all the help they can get. So what do you need to take better animal portraits? I've narrowed this down to seven factors. There could be a lot more, to be honest, if we broke it down even further. But these are the most broad kind of subjects that I think you need to take better portraits. Firstly, we need gear. If someone said to me, take my photo and I just have my hands, I can't. I need equipment. That's, it's a, the most basic thing of all. I need, need that mechanism to capture that shot. Then we need subjects. Oh, well, I'm good to have a camera, but if you don't have something in front of it, you can't take a photo. And then you need patience, practice, anticipation, timing, and safety. And they're the attributes that I've kind of come up with that help me. So when I'm shooting, these are all things that I'm working on and thinking through as I shoot. So in my kit, I shoot with a Canon a uh, DSLR body and a Sony A1 and various Tamron lenses. And I'm going to show you guys now a sample of some of my studio work. And I'll talk about the lenses I use there and some of my outdoor work and the lenses I use for that as well. So you need subjects. We need gear and we need subjects. Now, all of these categories flow into each other. So, yep, I've got the gear. Now I need the subjects. So in my studio, I photograph pets and wildlife. And I'm mostly using a selection of three lenses. In the studio, I sit very close to my subjects. I'm sitting literally this far away from them. So I mostly use that 24 to 70 mil portrait lens. Uh, it can focus the length of my forearm pretty much. So I know that I can be you know, that distance from the animal. I can do a whole body shot or a head shot and I'm sitting nice and close. If I'm doing macro in the studio, I'll use a macro lens. And on one occasion, I've used that 70 to 200 mil zoom. And that was when I was photographing venomous snakes. We have some pretty hectic snakes in Australia and I was photographing, I think it was tiger snakes, and I was standing back at the back of the room on a chair because if, if those things bit us, we had basically half an hour before we died. I think I held my breath for that whole shoot standing on that chair with that big mega zoom uh, because I didn't want to sit that close. <laughs> that would have been crazy. The tiger snake actually just, it was just, you know, just like you get 
Some animals that are more aggressive than others. This was a sort of tiger snake that if you're in the bush, it would chase you. It was quite nasty. And the snake was a, um, a rescue snake that they used for training to train people how to catch snakes and safely relocate them. So when they came in for photos, um, they said to me, oh, watch out, he's a bit grumpy. He's a grumpy snake. No one wants to meet a grumpy snake. And he just sat there and he just sat there spitting venom around the room. So the next day I had to completely glove and mask up and clean it down because if I touched that venom, then literally you know, accidentally and then touch my eye or something, uh, I wouldn't probably be sitting here today talking to you. So I photograph everything in the studio from little ducks to colourful birds. Uh, this is a bird here that's considered a pest and they, they kind of displace native wildlife. So a lot of them go into the vet clinics um, they fall out the nests as babies and the vets uh, basically raise them and you know, keep them as pets. They're quite um, colourful, crazy little pets. I photograph cats. Um, people often ask me the difference between cats and dogs. Um, it is pretty black and white. <laughs> cats come into the studio and think it's horrible. They hate me. They hate their owners. They hate their life on that day. They're quite happy sleeping on the bed. Dogs come in and they're like, wow, this is the best fun. There was a car ride, crazy lady giving me treats. She's telling me I'm really good. It's amazing. Uh, so they go home and think it's awesome and cats never ever want to see me again. Um, this cat has different colored eyes, obviously. He was hearing impaired and his owner used to push him around town in a stroller. And even now when I go to the store and I see a stroller, I like run up and I look in there in case there's a cat. And quite often there's just a human baby and I'm disappointed and just have to walk away. And people kind of like, that must be weird. This is probably the only photograph I've got of a cat smiling and he was actually yawning. And, you know, cats, you know, just generally look like this. That's their kind of photo face. Dogs have all sorts of expressions. Cats just generally give me a look of annoyance, uh, you know, disdain. Uh, this guy was yawning. And this photo has, um, this has been on the cover of the Tamron magazine they bring out quarterly. It's been on greeting cards. It's been on murals. Um, it's pretty much been everywhere because it's just such a rare shot of a cat looking happy <laughs> in a photo. And this was one of my competition entries. So occasionally I'll put up a photo for a competition just to see how it goes. You know, I like to do that more for myself than anything to just give a picture a bit of a run and, you know, see what other people think of it. And the background here, I don't Photoshop very often, but this background is actually a gravestone, a marble gravestone that I've edited in. And this judging for this competition was live and I could hear what they were saying. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they said, oh, yes, nice photo, you know, nice lighting, etc." And this cat doesn't have any skin. And I remember thinking, oh, that's not good. He definitely has skin. He just doesn't have any fur. So I'm not too sure if they're very familiar with cats. <laughs> they thought he didn't have any skin. I love photographing little puppies, big dogs with their tongues out. Uh, this was an, an elderly Great Dane. And what I love about this photo is, you know, when you say to kids sometimes, smile, and they go, and you go, oh, don't, don't smile, just be normal. I feel like that's what she's doing in that photo. I love photographing puppies. Um, people always ask me, how, do you, how long does it take to get these shots? This is a split second. So what I do is I start with one puppy and then I do two, three, four, and I load them up. So I know which puppy is good and which one's the cheeky, naughty one. Now I can tell you straight away from that shot, the cheeky, naughty one's the one that's popped up at the back in the blue collar. So I would lay everyone else down in the front. Those three kind of number two, three, and a four who were sleeping there, a bit sleepy, they would have been there first and I've put the other ones on the end. That pink one on with the pink collar on the end, looks like that one's about to jump off too. And then put the cheeky ones on last. So if they move, I can just put, keep putting them back. And it's just a split second. I clap my hands, you know, shoot with one hand. The puppies are looking and get the shot. Sleeping puppies. Um, puppies go for about half an hour. Then they literally crash. And when they crash, they're out. You can move their little feet and their ears wherever you want. Love photographing black dogs on black or black animals on black. So it's just all about the lighting. You just need to throw enough light on them to light up their fur. Uh, love photographing insects. So these are some, this was a macro shot. Um, this guy had a personality. He's got his little hands like that. Looks like he's like, you know, holding his own hands. He um, kept jumping on my eye. He was about this big and he was a rescue grasshopper. Who would have thought there's a thing? Someone had rescued him from somewhere. And he kept jumping on my eye while I was shooting. And so the grasshopper owner kept taking him off my eye. And it wasn't until the end of the shoot, I said, oh, they can't bite, can they? And his mouth was about this big, this guy. And he said, oh, yeah, however big their mouth is, they can bite. I was like, oh, goodness, he's been on my eye. He could have bitten out my eye. I could be like sitting here talking to you like this. I'd be like, what are her photos like? Oh, who cares? Do you hear how she lost her eye? It's a great story. Grasshopper ate her. So everything can potentially kill you, to be honest, even grasshoppers. They can eat your eye. 
We have some great reptiles in Australia from little lizards to snakes. Uh, this is a called a carpet python, also known as a children's pet. Don't know if I'd be giving one to my child, but because uh, they're quite big, but quite beautiful under the lights. And we have some amazing native animals in Australia. This is a little rescue possum. This is a baby Tasmanian devil. And baby koalas. Now, unfortunately, these are all orphaned baby koalas, which is just horrific. Uh, you know, there's even a thing. But the one at the front is about this big, and the one at the back is about that big. They're all babies. The one at the front is just the biggest. And when you put baby koalas together, they hug like this, and they walk around like that, and they do a train. And it's called a koala train. That's the cutest thing you've ever seen. Baby rescue kangaroo, Joey. And this little guy has, these are like pool floaties, those pool noodles you take in the swimming pool. They've been cut to make little splints for his legs. And lastly, a baby wombat. Wombats are like the cheekiest little Staffordshire Terrier dogs you've ever met in your life. They're so naughty. Outdoors, I shoot using natural light. I mostly use the Canon camera with these lenses on there. Now, out of these three lenses, the 150 to 600 mil would probably be my go-to. So most of the pictures you're going to see in the next little section are taken with a massive zoom. I prefer big zooms for outdoors because I can pick and choose subjects and I can stay a safe distance away. You know, animals can be unpredictable, don't want to trigger anything. And on the Sony, same thing, I have um, three lenses I use on there as well. And again, mostly the 150 to 500 mil, which is the equivalent to that, um, the mount for the Canon in um, 100 to 600 mil. So... I'll photograph any creatures I can get my hands on. Um, this is a baby orangutan at Singapore Zoo. They have free-ranging orangutan colonies that aren't in captivity. They roam around. And there was a baby there. Um, this was the cover of one of my books a few years ago as well. Um, and this guy, this guy is at our local zoo here. Um, our local zoo has actually rehabilitated orangutans and released them back into the wild, which is quite amazing. Um, this guy was up, I was up on the roof photographing at the zoo, and he was sitting up there. And as we walked up, I walked up with the keeper up to this kind of railing area where you know there was this, these rails that you had to walk along on the roof and there was an orangutan to my left and as we walked up she went and the keeper looked at her and said hey that's rude you're not allowed to blow raspberries um if you do that again you'll get your we had frozen bananas in a bucket you'll get your frozen banana last she was like okay um and now this picture has won a lot of awards and when it's when it's judged quite often in the judging again the judges are saying oh this is a great statement between man and beast and wildlife and captivity and all this sort of stuff you know wow amazing what they see in it so she got told off for doing the raspberry anyway i turned my back on her and i started photographing this guy and all of a sudden i realized he's kind of looking past me you notice he's not quite looking at us in this shot i thought what's he looking at and i turned around and the raspberry blower had pooped in her hand and gone like that and was about to throw it at us. So I yelled to the keeper and said, she's got a poop. And he turns around and he said, you drop that right now. And she just went, oh, she let it go and it fell down to the ground. So it made me laugh when they were saying, this is a photo about man and beast and nature and captivity. I'm like, yeah, I guess it is, but it's also a photograph of one orangutan watching another orangutan about to hell a poop. Little baby monkey reaching out. Now, again, benefit of a Zoom, I wasn't actually very close. You know, the, the baby's with the mother. I didn't want to, you know, tip off the mother to be angry that I was too close. So I was a fair distance away. Um, this was taken in India at the monkey temple. Thought like I was being watched and I turned around and I was. And I could just use my Zoom to capture this little face peeping over the brick wall. Uh, rescue tiger from Cambodia. Uh Again, had that mega zoom in the Antarctic, I could pick and choose elements of these animals. So, you know, cold feet on a frozen rock. And just the, there's, there are 5,000 pairs of breeding penguins here, but I was able to isolate them. And you'll notice too that my outdoor shots aren't too dissimilar to my studio shots in that the background is generally nothing. Now, a studio shoot, I shoot on a white backdrop or a black backdrop. Outdoors, I usually try and go for even pattern, even color, sky, and not too many man made elements if I can help it. And in the Galapagos Islands, there are millions of marine iguanas. I went there pre-COVID 2019, and they were all laying around sneezing on each other. Like, that just wouldn't go down today. It's quite disgusting. And so I laid down on the ground, and I photographed up into the sky. So there's this, this marine iguana. Was, there were thousands around here, but it just looks like he was sitting there by himself. And um, super prehistoric, quite amazing. In the Galapagos, there's also three different coloured sandy beaches, white, black, and yellow. And this was the... The, um, sorry, white, red, yellow, and black. And this was the red sand beach. And again, there's very strict rules in the Galapagos about distance, safe distances from wildlife, you know, to ensure they're not stressed or harassed. So the, the big zoom, I was a fair way away from this, just kneeling down on the sand and I could get this shot. 
And also on the Galapagos Islands, this bird just jumped onto our boat as we're sailing out in the middle of nowhere on our navigation equipment. And it's a frigate bird just sitting right there. And with the big zoom, um, the, the distance to focus with that lens is about 30 inches. Um, so you can get pretty close with that big zoom to these subjects. Uh, in Tanzania, on the Serengeti, just driving along and a, an ostrich popped up out the window, <laughs> got a quick shot. And one of my favorite animals in the world, I've even got a tattoo of them, I'm not sure if you guys can see on my arm, and here's the island where they live. These are called quokkas. If you Google quokka, they're world renowned. They're small marsupials, probably about this big, uh, related, kind of like kangaroo, they have a little pouch and they live on an island where they don't have any predators. The island's a paradise. You can only ride bikes around it. It's got beautiful beaches. It's about 20 minutes by ferry from the city I live in. And people do selfies with them. So they're quite famous for selfies. And they're unlike any wildlife I've ever met in the world. And I've traveled to all seven continents. They basically, when you see them, because they don't have any fear or anything, they just run up to you. And they're like, hi. Even the penguins in the Antarctic that aren't faced by people, they just walk past, but they don't run up. These guys are super friendly. And when they eat, they look like they're smiling. So they always look happy. So they're the happiest animal on earth they've been coined. Don't have a look easy subjects. Sometimes there are subjects that we think, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. We're like, oh, it's just a bird in the backyard or something like that. You know, don't overlook hermit crabs at the beach or ghost crabs or any sort of mud crab at the beach. If you sit there for long enough, they'll come out. Don't overlook farm animals. Um, quite often too, I'm asked, you know, this shot is a crop. I try and shoot like this. So most of these photos, there might be a tiny little bit I've cropped out to make it parallel or something, but I'm shooting with this in mind. I want this to be nice and straight and I want it to be a face shot. So as I'm shooting, I'm shooting half a head. There is no whole head shot of this originally that I've cut in half. And um, now, obviously being from Australia, we think your squirrels are the best thing we've ever seen. I just got back last week from a trip to Minnesota and it snowed, so I was beside myself. Uh, it, was, um, it was like... 30 degrees and I was the only one out in the car park running around for 40 minutes in a t-shirt in the snow. Everyone else was horrified, <laughs> one that I was out there and two that it was snowing. But two, um, my last day there, I saw a squirrel. So my two like life dreams were ticked off. I saw a squirrel on a picnic table. It's very, very happy. Um, in Central Park, there's some black squirrels. But again, you know, urban wildlife. If I even photograph a rat, if that's the only thing that's around. Uh, reptiles, you know, little lizards and uh, things around your house. Sometimes you have these in your garden. And of course, uh, insects. Now, this guy was photographed in Sri Lanka uh, on the edge of a swimming pool. And when I saw him, I saw my friend grab her camera. So I jumped in with my clothes on. So that's me with the, the cap on back the front. And you can see the little tiny dragonfly there that we're shooting. And my friend in the front's like, they're crazy. Like, what are they even doing? Got their cameras in the swimming pool. Now, I stood up a little bit and shot down. And that's how I got that white all the way around. And then when my friend saw the photo, she was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should have got my camera. <laughs> so don't ever let anyone tell you it's cr you're taking a crazy shot. We need patience. We need time patience and image patience. So we need to take a lot of shots and sometimes we need to wait. Now, I'm not very good at waiting. I kind of get, you know, I massively respect National Geographic photographers who sit there for hours on end, a week, sometimes months to get a photo. I'll sit there for half an hour and if nothing's happening, I'll go and find somewhere where it is. But it's something I had to learn because it doesn't come naturally to me to sit and wait. When I was in Tanzania uh, in 2019, I got to um, go to set this amazing lodge and they had this big rocky outcrop in the middle. And these are rock dassies or rock hyrax. We were joking calling them guinea pigs. They kind of look like guinea pigs, but they start from like this big to this big. And to the people in Tanzania, these are kind of the equivalent of how you guys would view squirrels. So they're not like rat and mouse level, but they're not quite common and they're not. If you see one, they just walk past. They wouldn't really take a photo. So I'd been in the swimming pool and the day, the day's tours had finished and it was had happy hour and I got in the pool and I got out. Everyone else was in the pool. Um, ironically, they were doing the Nutbush City Limits dance. Don't really know why, but it was a good day. And I walked out and as I walked past the rocky outcrop where these guys live, I saw these two babies, two little babies. So I ran to my room and got my camera. And I sat there a fair distance away, big zoom. And I was like, oh, I'm going to start photographing these babies. I'm going to just wait, patience, wait and see what happens. There were two babies. Started taking lots of shots. I want to get a nice sharp shot. Then suddenly another baby came out. I was like, wow, there's three babies waiting. I was waiting. I was just being patient, taking a lot of shots, trying to get the shot I wanted in my mind's eye. Next minute, there were four babies. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Where's this going to end? And it was getting dark. You, know, you can tell that picture's not entirely sharp. It wasn't the photo I wanted, but I kept shooting. I'd had a few drinks in the swimming pool 
and uh, it was also getting dark. So I was trying not to shake the camera. I'm thinking, okay, you've had a few margaritas, hold everything still, and just also it's getting dark. Like make sure everything's fast enough to get these shots sharp. Next minute, there were five babies. Like, wow. I mean, they thought I was as great as I thought they were. And then there were six babies. I was like, far out. When's this going to end? And just by waiting and waiting, being very still, keep shooting. Because I still didn't have the shot I wanted. None of these shots were what I wanted. I keep going. Finally, there were seven babies. And this was the shot I wanted. Now, interestingly, when you go on tour, it's awesome, especially when you're somewhere like Africa. You actually stop on that Serengeti, and there are so many animals in front of you. Sometimes it's paralysis because you do not know what to photograph first. So you don't photograph anything. You're just like, whoa, you have to actually stop, slow down your brain and pick something to focus on and then move away from there kind of thing. So I uh, took this shot and on tour, we're all standing next to each other in the Jeep, you know, our, our safari vehicle. We all have the similar sort of shots. We all have the same pictures because we're all shooting the same things and we're seeing the same action unfold in front of us. So at the end of the tour, I always like to, um, when I run a tour, you know, we vote for the best photo of the tour. And this got voted best tour photo of the very common rock dassies because it was the only picture no one else had. And I remember running to the swimming pool while they're still doing the nut bush dance in the pool and showing them this picture on the back of the camera. They all jumped out to run to the, the rock dassies. But in the meantime, a bird had flown over and the rock dassies had, had run and they, they went, went and hot, um, hid in the rocks because the birds are predators. So, you know, sometimes the most common thing um, can be the, the best subject. I had my gear ready and I was just being patient. I was taking a lot of shots till I got what I wanted and I was just sitting there and just waiting. And by waiting, if I'd walked away after those first two, I'd have a picture of two. I had to have patience and they delivered. You need to practice. If at first you don't succeed, you can take a million more shots. Fully abuse digital photography. That's what it's there for. There's no, you know, no reason to not shoot and shoot. If I have an animal in front of me, I will do a whole body shot, a head shot, half face. I'll see if it moves its head to the side, get that shot, something artistic, something creative, some weird angles and compositions so that when that elephant or whatever it is, is moves out of the scene, I don't get back to the hotel or you know whatever and say, oh, I missed five different poses. I should have got them. I overshoot everything while that subject is there as much as I can. So getting the shot, we've all got that friend that says, oh, look at this amazing photo I took. And you're like, is it a log floating down the river? And they're offended. They're like, no. You're like, oh, sorry. When the elephant, I think that's the elephant's hip, rolls around in the pond, it has to come out. So, again, just waiting. Watch and wait. Watch and wait, and it pops out. Now, this elephant, this is the same elephant as that piece of hip floating in the water. When this elephant came out, it firstly did a little bubble like that. Then it did the big kind of question mark splash. Then it did the actual splash. Now, if I put all three of those pictures on social media, people would be like, look at the first one, get to the second one, be like, these are kind of the same same thing. If you can say it in one photo, you know, shoot a lot, but pick then pick that hero shot. So this was a photo I chose to put out. And this is a rescue elephant in Cambodia. You want to practice. So it's just waiting, practicing. All these things are tying in. It's practicing. Practice angles and composition. Don't be afraid to experiment. So in Africa, um, oh, this is actually a, an, an elephant from Cambodia. Um, I loved using angles and using my camera to crop bits in, as I said. So this is shot in camera. I've zoomed in and intentionally just taken that photo. There would also be a full headshot photo, but this wasn't cropped from it. This is a separate image. Um, little monkey again in Africa, preening the baby, pulling like prickles or something out of the baby's leg. It's a little baby's foot. And an, an old monkey's hand in monkey forest in Bali, Indonesia. And it looks human-like, you know, like how amazing. The detail is quite remarkable. Um, the back of a quokka. So I showed you the front of the quokka. This is the back of a quokka, the back of a quokka's ears. And while I was on safari in Africa, I had photographed every giraffe, every zebra, every every elephant, and I was like, I just want something that looks a bit different. So I started trying to do deliberately blurry shots. So they're not out of focus. That's a bad photo. Deliberately blurry. And it's quite hard to do. You have to, um, you know, the, the highest f-stop that your lens goes to, maybe you say f32, you wind it up to that. And then you basically, so that slows everything right down, um, 100 ISO, and as you shoot, you kind of just move the camera. You have to do a lot of pictures. Again, it, it's coming into taking a lot of shots, being patient, practicing, patience, practice, they're all tying in. And just over and over again, if you go too fast, the whole subject disappears. If you go too slow, it just looks like a, a badly taken photo. I love this because it looks like paint running down. And I did it with everything I could get my hands 
Um, some people look at these and they, they're a bit trippy. They're like, whoa, <laughs> magic eye painting. <laughs> I mean, there's no reward for seeing anything in it. Um, but I did it with everything. And I actually made this elephant disappear a lot because I was going too fast. Um, this is in Nagorogo Crater. But I love these. And when I got home, some people are like, they're yuck. <laughs> and I put them on Facebook and I put, um, I sold them as prints and I donated the money to some a conservation organization. And I sold a heap of them. So I was like, people don't think they're yuck. I made lots of money. So, you know, again, don't, you know, you ask for 100 opinion, opinions, you're going to get 100 opinions. It doesn't necessarily mean they're the right ones. And then I thought, oh, what if I focus on the grasses and just blur out the subjects? So I played around with that for a bit. So focusing on the foreground and you know, there's wildebeest and um, zebra in the background. I thought that's kind of cool. I like stuff like this that's not literal. It's, it needs interpretation, you know. Um, and then I thought, oh, what if I photograph the prey in focus um, or the predator in focus and the prey blurry? Because that's kind of cool. So this hyena was circling a pack of zebra. I didn't get any of them, but it was walking around. And then I had the, the lion, the elephants came to the waterhole. And when the elephants came to the waterhole, the lions got out of there and went and sat on the hill. So elephants rule, um, even over the lions. And this guy's just sitting and watching. So this series of um, predator and prey, where the, the predator is in focus, I only got two shots. So it's a very short photo series because I didn't see any more. But uh, going back again uh, this year, actually in July, so maybe I'll get a few more pictures to add to it. You need to anticipate, you need to learn behaviours, preempt, preempt movement and responses. The more you know about animal behaviour, the better it's going to serve you to know what they're going to do next. And this ties into safety too at the end, you know, like to, to make sure you know what the next move's going to be. So two of the most common questions I get asked, how do you get them to sit still and how do you get them to pose? Now, this is obviously generally in the studio. And the answer to both is the same, I don't. They're animals. They're not going to sit still. They're going to do whatever they want. And it's our job to capture those moments we see as photos. Now, most of the time I work organically, meaning same as when I'm shooting outdoors. When I'm outdoors and there's just a zebra off in the field or a donkey or it could be a bird, we have to choose those moments we see as pictures. The subject is having free reign. I kind of do the same thing in the studio. The animal's in front of me. Yeah, I've got a treat or a toy. I can kind of direct them to look at it now and then. But if they don't want to, it's just my job to time everything. So I just, I don't um, push them around, move them around. You know, everything's at their own will. I put a bit of treat, you know, on the floor and they'll walk to it generally, you know, and I'll get some shots. And then they might lick their nose or yawn, you know, and it's up to me to be ready. Again, so all oh, this sort of stuff ties in. Anticipation. I had these little rescue rabbits in the studio and they're eating this piece of grass. And I was like, hang on, when they get close enough, what's going to happen? They're chewing down on that grass. Boop. And that was just from them eating a piece of grass. Now, if I'd got those two bunnies and tried to make them sit like that, firstly, not very nice for them. Secondly, the more you try and force animals together, the more they're going to push apart. You know, it's just not, not fun for anyone. So I was like, okay, I can use this grass to get this cute little shot. This was a rescued seabird called a Caspian tern. He was about eight weeks old. And I got a, you know, the rescue wanted some pictures of him. You know, 300 photos like this. And I was kind of like, they're nice, but not really that exciting. They, I said, does he kind of do anything? They said, oh, yeah, he loves his lunch. I said, is it his lunchtime? They said, oh, yeah, he could have lunch now. <laughs> Can we get him his lunch? They pulled out these little fish for his lunch, and he went crazy. And this is a far more engaging photo because the rescue can use this to show that's where the food goes, and this is what's inside this bird's mouth, which I've never seen before. It's quite horrific. <laughs> so he was released a few days later, but um, much better photo than that, you know, for, for them to use. This little tiny rescue possum. This is a little tiny log sitting about that high off the backdrop that I've got him on. You can tell straight away, as soon as we put her on there, she's, she's not happy, ears are back, she's not comfortable. I took one shot and said, no, please pick her up. She's, she feels vulnerable, don't like that. Don't like to make animals stressed in any way. And I said, what does she love? And they said, she loves sitting in her foster carer's hand. You would have seen this picture earlier. There she is, that's the same possum, two minutes later sitting in the foster carer's hand. This little guy is a sugar glider, a rescue sugar glider and he's eating a little snack there. If you Google sugar glider, white background studio, you'll get lots of photos like this. There's nothing that special about it. And I was like, mm, I want something different. I switched to the black background and I noticed he kept running up the arm of his foster carer. And I said to the foster carer, could you maybe next time he does that, just very gently go like that. And we'll see if he'll like drop down and stand on the backdrop and then run back up your arm. He said, okay, so you know, I said, just do it very gently. See if he'll just kind of let go and go back up. In that split second, I saw Max, his name is, running down the carer's arm. I was ready. I was anticipating. Max put his little feet down and I snapped a shot. 
Now, it looks like the carer's put his hand there and Max has walked up and grabbed his finger, but he didn't. He ran down his arm, he let go, and then he ran straight back up, and that was it. He never did it again. I photographed him since then, and we did is fly around the room and have a great time because he was having a party. Um, never got anything close to this. Um, and, again, it's just one of those shots that if you miss it, it's like the one that got away when you go fishing, you know, might never come back again. Um, and echidna, unlike porcupines, they can't release their spikes, but they are very prickly. So sometimes we see them on the road. We will stop and we'll grab the rubber floor mat from our cars and put that around them and lift them up and put them off the road. Um, this guy was a rescue and the rescue, wildlife rescue wanted some pictures. Very, very low set eyes. So it's very hard to get a catch light in the eyes, which is something that I love. It gives the eyes life. And I took a few pictures like this and I was like, mm, yeah, they're kind of really doing much. And I said, um, what, what's interesting about an echidna? And they said, well, see that little beak, that little nose? Um, their tongue is as long as your forearm. And I said, that's not true. I, I kind of knew it was, but I just wanted to show me. I said, prove it. So she put a little bit of food um, in the edge of that picture there for the echidna. And next minute, bloop. Now, I do not know how that rolls up and fits in that little tiny beak. Not my job. I didn't sign the echidna, but that's amazing. And for education, again, this photo, you know, it ticks the boxes for them because they show this to kids or the people, look how long their tongues are. They're like, wow, that's amazing. And they, you put a plate of food in front of a kid and that tongue just flips around and eats all the food. You need timing. You need to be ready always. So practice patience, anticipation, timing. You've got to time it. It's all very well to have these animals doing these things in front of us, but if you're not ready with your timing, you're anticipating it's going to happen. If you're not pushing the button at the right time, you're going to miss it. You want to make sure that when the flamingo suddenly appears at the beach in the Galapagos, a um, random inland lake and walks across the pond, you get the shot. And I spent ages, this again was a situation where there's a lot going on. There were marine iguanas swimming around. <coughs> Excuse me, there were turtles on the beach. People didn't know what to photograph. I sat and just photographed the flamingo. You know, I was ready and I was getting ready as it walked. I was trying to get, anticipate and then time the movement of that leg coming up, try not to cut off the reflection. Um, and again, probably using my big zoom, my big Tamron zoom. And at this point, I think I was using my Canon camera. If you're ever in the Antarctic, you know, you want to take a million photos. You know, I had some people on my tour that um, would come out onto the ice and that our crew would say, we can stay here for four hours. And after an hour and a half, two hours, I'd look around and out of a boat of 80 people, there'd only be five left on the ice and I'd be one of them. I'd be like, where is everyone? And they're like, oh, they're back at the bar. They're on the boat having hot drinks at, in, at the bar. And I'm like, I didn't come here to have hot drinks. I came here to spend four hours, every minute I can on this ice. And when I came back, some people from that tour said, oh, I want to go back to the Antarctic. I'd like to do it again. And I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I need to do it again because I photographed everything, every minute that I could. You know, so if you ever do go on those trips, make the most of it and, and have your timing ready. When you're on a Zodiac and an iceberg floats by and as it comes past, there's a penguin riding on it, you want to get that shot and it's snowing. I mean, how magic. It's just incredible down there. In Sri Lanka, if you're on safari, there's an amazing wildlife in Sri Lanka. I had no idea. I led a tour there and I had no clue that it was on par with Africa, for, especially for elephants. You know, they're just an epic amount of elephants. We went to this park, elephant park, um, wildlife, you know, natural reserve. And I said to our guide, how many elephants will we see today? Thinking two. And he goes, oh, 100. And I thought, that's not true. And then next minute out, we rolled out to this lake and there are 100 elephants running around everywhere, doing whatever they want. You want to have your timing ready. I was anticipating the babies are walking together. I was taking lots of shots. I was practicing. I was having patience to wait and see what happened. And then when they did a little headbutt, I got my timing right and I got the shot. Little baby elephants. Again, you want your timing right. In Africa, we were driving to this, um, this lion and one of our Jeeps on that tour stopped to photograph a giraffe. And I saw the giraffe and I said to my driver, keep going. We've got heaps of giraffes today. I want to go and see that lion over there. As I got there, um, he was kind of crouching. He popped his head up. I was like, oh, because I thought, you know, he's probably going to look at us when we pull up. He did. I anticipated. He used my timing. I got the shot. And then he popped back down. When the vehicle that had been photographing the giraffe rolled up, they went, what are you all looking at? Because it's just a patch of grass. And I showed them the shot on the camera. They're like, darn it. We wish we'd got here and got that shot. They were too busy getting the, the giraffe shot. But I was ready. He didn't pop his head out again. We sat there for half an hour. I said, he might do it again. Didn't do it again. So if I'd missed that, gone. No shot. And again, in the Galapagos Islands, when we got there, it was a bit, the weather was a bit rough and we decided to go out in the Zodiac and we, we motored up to this big rocky outcrop and there was a blue-footed booby sitting on there. We're very excited because it's one of the birds, 
that we'd wanted to see, you know, in the Galapagos. And I started taking a million photos. So I'm on the Zodiac, the boat's rocking. I've got image stabilization on my lens I'm using, so it helps greatly. I was taking these photos and my guide said, Alex, why are you taking so many photos? You'll see millions of blue-footed boobies. So all the other people on the boat, on the Zodiac, kind of got a bit photo shamed and they put their cameras down. And I said, no, I'm going to photograph everything when it's in front of me. That's what I, my job, you know. And he was like, okay, but you don't need to. You're going to see heaps. This is just the first one. And I was like, mm-mm. I want to take its picture. Big storm came through that night. And guess what? We didn't see a single other blue-footed booby that entire trip. And I was the only person that had a photo. Because the guide's advice, you know, oh, you'll see plenty. Never trust it. And even if you do, this might have been the best shot I got. You know, the other ones might have been all dirty or there might have been something happening. You know, they didn't come around again. So everyone else that put their cameras down was like, I should have listened to you, not him. And I was like, well, I just want to take pictures. I don't care if I see a million of them. I still want to take pictures of all the ones I come across. And lastly, you need to be safe. You need safety. It's it's imperative. Now, quite often um, when I travel to overseas countries, um, I've traveled a lot throughout Southeast Asia. And because I'm the animal photographer, they think I know everything about animal safety and animals. They'll, they'll say, <coughs> excuse me, Miss Alex, we need you to photograph tiger, other tiger. Please step over this fence and go through this gate and come around this barricade and go right up to that wire where there's the tiger. And I'm like, why is there a barricade, a fence and another fence? And everyone else is behind that or the public are behind that. And they'll say, oh, that's for safety. <laughs> you know, no safety for me. I'm right up at the fence where the tiger is. Um, because they think, oh, she knows how to deal with the tiger. I don't, I don't know how to deal with the tiger. Um, I know that they can jump very high and very far in a split second. So even if they're a fair way away, they could you know, get to me pretty quick. So you've got to do your research, research animal behavior. You've got to set your own rules and you've got to have self-awareness. I always wear investing good boots when I'm shooting outdoors, good quality footwear, because if I need to run, uh, I only run if I'm being chased, but if I'm being chased, I need to run. Uh, I need to make sure my feet are always sturdy. You know, some of the surfaces I'm walking on are unsteady and I need to make sure that these boots are going to help me get out of there if I need to get out of there in a hurry. And my own rules, if you're not comfortable with something, don't do it. So in Cambodia, there's a rescue centre called Nom Tamau Wildlife Rescue Centre. It's a public zoo, but all the animals are rescued. It's kind of hard to get your head around when you're in there that every single one of these animals has been rescued from um, because they've been displaced due to um, land degradation. They've been rescued as illegal uh, they were kept as illegal pets. They were being smuggled um, and they're all in there. So this is Lucky the elephant. There were three types of elephants there, ones that have, uh, ones that are friendly, ones that have hurt people and ones that have killed people. I was working with the friendly and hurt people category of elephant. And so Lucky's friendly. She's going for a daily walk. Now in this photo, she's not interested in me at all. She's picking up dirt with her trunk and she's throwing it on her back to cool down. Um, I've photographed Lucky a number of times over the years. I thought we were quite good friends. Um, so I went back again a few years later, and this time um, I was crouching down in front of her. She was ripping up trees, going off into the, the jungle there and smashing around and coming back. And as I was walking along with her this day, I was at her flank there, at her leg at the back, and I was patting her on the, the flank, going, oh, look, we're like good friends. And all of a sudden her tail swung around and went and hit me in the face. And I remember thinking, that's a weird mistake for her to make. Surely she knew I was standing right here. Yeah, she sure did. And then, not heeding the warning, I did it again. I thought that was just, and she hit me again in the face. And I thought, don't do it a third time. I was just patting her, but she was like, don't touch me. We're, we're friends, but we're not that good friends. She just could have literally picked up her leg and gone, and, you know, yeeted me into space. She didn't, but I heeded the warning, but I had to have it twice. Sometimes you only get one. I work for a rescue organization called Free the Bears. They're based here in Australia, but they've got rescue sanctuaries in Cambodia, Vietnam, India, and Laos. And in the Laos sanctuary, they, have a, they had a bear, she's passed away now, but her name was Champa. And when she was little, she had hydrocephalus. So she had fluid on the brain. So she used to look down a lot because her head was quite heavy. And they flew in a human brain surgeon to alleviate the fluid from her brain. And she had brain surgery and it effectively cured her hydrocephalus. She had like a drain put in to her stomach. And uh, the, the boss of Free the Bears, my friend Matt, said to me, do you want to come and photograph her? She's a full-grown rescue captive but kind of wild moon bear but she's friendly because she's had brain surgery and she um she likes people i went sure so i flew to lao thinking this is amazing and the day i got there matt went in first and someone said to me are you here to photograph champa i said yeah i'm going in with her they said oh is that wise I said oh, apparently she likes people and they said well she likes one person i was like oh I hope 
and that's me. So anyway, too late, I flung to the other side of the, you know, the world to go on photograph there. So excuse me, going, I go in to meet her, and Matt goes first, and he gave her some sort of treat, some sort of food, and I think he thought she, she thought he was going to take it away. As he pulled his hand back, she got her right hand and she swiped at him, and he jumped back. I'm right behind him about to meet her, and he said she's never done that before. She's never acted aggressively like that before in her five years. And I'm standing there thinking, great, of all the days she's being unpredictable is the day I'm going to photograph her. So anyway, I then went out. We went outside with her. And this is a big box of fruit. And I was handing her the fruit and very carefully letting her know I wasn't going to take it. Um, sometimes she'd just hurl it back at me. She didn't want watermelon. And I'd stayed away from that right hand. Uh, and then Matt said to me, also, also need to let you know, because she does have this head injury from her surgery, um, she may be more unpredictable than a normal moon bear. <laughs> Normally in captivity, they'll know if they want to kill you or just hug you. She may think she's hugging you and she's actually, you know, hugging too tight. So just be careful if she grabs you or something. <laughs> so in the end, I, I watch her body language very well, but I was on edge the whole time. I'm on a little ledge there. I was about ready to roll off the back of it if she came for me. But she's actually eating fruit and she's looking up because an aeroplane flew over. Um, she had quite a small enclosure. So part of this photo shoot was to raise money to get her a bigger one, which we did. And then she didn't like it. She liked a small contained space and she spent a lot of time inside because she, the light affected her eyes. But we were really good friends, but you've got to manage your own safety. You know, she could do some damage if she wanted to. She didn't, but I was also very, very careful. You know, I'm putting myself in that situation. I'm listening to the advice of other people. I'm just not triggering her at all, you know. Um, someone on that shoot said, stand next to her and have a photo. Now, I'm not really into that. I'm there to take the photos. I don't really want to be in them. I was like, okay, no worries. And as I turned to stand next to her, she looked at me, and you can see in her eyes the intensity I'm right near, my elbow's right near that quick right hand that I saw swipe at Matt. And I just quickly turned and said, no, that's the photo we got together. I was like, I'm not turning my head from her. You know, that you turn your back, that's when you're going to get grabbed. I was like, I'm not going to do it. And um, she unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but we got to the point that if I turned up at the sanctuary and she heard my voice, she'd come outside to play. I'd give her a soccer ball and she'd just like pitch it at my head. I was like, this is a fun game. Get out of there, give it back, she'd just throw it. And she just loved having a person to play with. And then she actually got, um, they had a, her keeper, but they actually had a person that would just go and sit with her and play games with her all day. That's all she wanted, that and to eat her little snacks. Um, also with Free the Bears, they have a sanctuary in India that they run with um, a group called Wildlife um, SOS. And excuse me, all the people from my tour were sitting up here near this electric fence watching uh, Matt, that's Matt down there, Matt and I photograph the blind bears. Now we were photographing the blind bears to get adoption photographs for free the bears adoption certificates. So you can pick and choose which bear you want. And they had about six bears that were blind. And, and so he said to the keeper, please just let one out at a time. And I was like, are you going to be okay with these blind bears? And they're like, yeah, they're full grown captive, but kind of wild moon bears, but they're blind. So they'll just like run around a bit and you can get away from them because they can't see you. Well, they have very good sense of smell. So that bear there is actually on my trail. I look quite calm. I'm not. I'm panicking because I was going round and round those sticks being chased by that bear. Everyone thought it was hilarious. I thought it was horrifying. Trying to take a photo, not looking like I'm completely having a meltdown because um, the bear's like, where is she? I can smell a new person. I'm going to eat them. So I was running around. Matt and I are photographing. When you have your camera up, you don't have any peripheral vision. Can't see what's coming. All of a sudden, I heard a noise and I look and there's five more bears in this enclosure. And I said, Matt, Matt pulled his camera down. What the heck? And he's like, oh, no. He's like, the keepers let all the bears out. There are now six blind bears running around, sniffing, trying to get us. Matt and I just, and everyone up here watching, taking photos, laughing, having best day ever. Anyway, we call it, Matt's screaming out to the keeper. I mean, we're calling his name. He's disappeared. He's left us in there. He's not, no one's watching our bats and we're shooting. And Matt says, um, it was some name like, where's Chompy? And I said, who's Chompy? And he said, he, well, he's a blind bear, he's a blind bear, but he's highly aggressive and he tries to like kill the keepers. And thankfully that day, Chompy hadn't been let out. He was still in the den in the building, which is just off to the left. And so eventually the keeper comes back and Matt says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm helping you. I let out, let out all the bears for you, you know, hectic. Um, and we're like, can you please? So these bears respond to the keeper. He can just whistle and they go back in the den. So he called them all back in and the photos were done. We got the shots, but, you know, and you can even see the macaque monkeys there on the fence watching the show. So you need equipment, subjects, patience, practice, anticipation, timing, safety. All these things tie in together. We can talk about, you know, you can Google settings, you can Google, you know, and those things change all the time depending on light, but you have to have these, these things in order to take effective animal portraits. Do things go wrong? Mm, no, not really. Working with animals, it always goes to plan. 
Um, okay, sometimes it goes wrong. Sometimes it totally goes pear-shaped <laughs> really, really badly. And um, I think I've, I've been very, over the very last, last few years, working on another presentation called The 15 Times I Almost Really Kind of Nearly Died because I've nearly been offed by everything from a grasshopper to a hedgehog to a tiger, you name it, um, you know, to bears. Uh, free the bears have tried to kill me many times. I keep going back um, for them. You know, animals can be hectic and you've got to be switched on. So if the things go wrong, they will they will pee on your black backdrop. Um, this little rescue pig, my friend was sitting behind him and when he went to the toilet, the urine was touching his feet. So he started kicking and he kicked all in my friend's face. I was fine, so I thought that was quite funny, but I did have to clean it all down. They will pee on your white backdrop. Now, I have to say here, I don't generally intend to take photos of animals peeing. It's a whole different type of photography I'm not into. But greyhounds can't normally sit because they have such big muscles on their back legs and such big butts. So I thought she was going to sit. And as she sat down, I started shooting. And all of a sudden, she went to the toilet. And then afterwards, she was so embarrassed and I felt so bad. Um, this is white paper, backdrop paper, a big paper roll. So I just cut it, threw it in the trash, rolled out and a fresh sheet and we we're good to go. They will pull your hair. I had to have some photos taken a few years ago, uh, promotional kind of pictures. And someone said, let's put this great big um, cockatoo on your shoulder. Their beaks, if you give them your finger like that, they can snap it off. You can snap it in half. It's how strong they are. Those um, carry crates you get for dogs and cats that are that hard plastic, if you put them in there, they just bust it all off, fly out. They're very strong. So I was yanking chunks of my hair out. Then someone thought, that looks like fun for Alex. So let's give her another one. So they put another one in. This one jumped up and down on my head. That's the hair puller, actually. They had put this one on my shoulder. The hair puller then jumped up and down on my head and scratched all through my hair, had all these bleeding scratches later. Um, and you can see in both shots, I'm just keeping still. I just think someone is going to save me. Please save me. I just keep very still. Uh, this is my previous car that I had. I had an American car. It was a Chrysler PT Cruiser. And I went out to my friend's farm rescue sanctuary and Vinnie the goat ran in front of my car and made me stop. Jump up the up the front hood. You can see the the skid marks there. He's been sliding down the that fender. <laughs> excuse me. Up the roof, jumping up and down on the sunroof. I thought it was really funny. I got out and took a photo. He kept jumping off, sliding down. I'd go to drive off. He'd do it again, stop me from driving. In the end, I had to ring my friend in the house and say, "Can you please come and get Vinny? I can't drive." And then I realised he'd scratched on that hood. Um, all the way down to the paint and done about three thousand dollars worth of damage. Um, ironically, right when I got that car uh, fixed, it got hit. I got T-boned at a traffic light. So a lady ran a red light and hit, and the car got written off. So I got a new car. But um, right after I paid for it to be fixed. Uh, then I was uh, doing some video uh, behind the scenes. I was being filmed for a video and doing some shoots at this farm sanctuary. I was laying down on the ground, and Vinny decided to jump on me. He's literally jumping up and down. So when I got up off the ground, my back probably still isn't right. And this was about five years ago. They will squish you against the fence. This is my friend's rescue sanctuary in Tasmania. It's an island at the bottom of Australia. And she said, do you want to photograph the pigs? And I was like, I don't really know much about pigs other than from watching Silence of the Lambs, you know, one of the, the prequel or movies or the sequel movies, uh, that if you fall down, they can eat your bones. So I was like, oh, don't fall down. You'll get eaten. I was a bit scared and they're massive. Look how big they are. And I was shooting, I was shooting there leaning against the fence and all of a sudden I felt a squish. And when I looked down, there was a pig park there and I just used her as a four-legged tripod. But she would not budge. I was stuck until she moved on. They'll bite you on the fingers. This is a rescue. This is my hand. Shows you how small that little kitten is. It's a rescued baby leopard cat kitten. World's most expensive illegal exotic pet. And this is in Cambodia in the rescue center. Um, someone, after I took this photo, it was just playing. It's really nice, really cute little kitten. Oh, wow, amazing. Someone came along and thought, oh, I'll help her with her photos and threw in a piece of chicken. And this thing turned into a hellcat. It went, Row! and I was like, oh, I don't want your raw chicken. And it's like it's hitting, biting, scratching. And I walked out and I used the hand sanitizer and I had hundreds of invisible stinging cuts, tiny, tiny little stinging cuts on my hands that had been shredded by this little tiny kitten's claws. They will hit you in the face. This is a res these are rescue baby kangaroo joeys, and my friends run this rescue. And they said we've got um, they've got fifteen joeys. I said, oh, bring them all in. That'll be fun. So we let them all go. I don't know where the other twelve are. They're probably hiding because this is Mabel. Mabel likes to smack you in the face while you're photographing. So and she really likes you to go like that back very gently. So I'm having to stop doing the photos to play with Mabel. You can see the other kangaroos like the one at the back. It's like hurry up, Mabel. It's my turn for a photo. Um, they'll they'll assault you. And, you know, you could just be nice back to them. And lastly, this is a camera belt. You can see that I'm wearing a belt. 
Um, it's called Spider Holster, and I wear that so I don't have to put my camera strap around my neck. Um, it's got a hand strap there, and this is a cute little photo of the Joey sitting on the camera. Um, you can see the camera sitting kind of side on, so when I kneel down, it's not hitting the ground. And Spider Holster said to me, could you get some pictures of our gear with an Aussie animal? I was like, what better Aussie animal than a baby koala? I took all these photos, and I wrote to them and said, I'm so sorry. Here's the photo. You can't use it. I said, why not? It's great. Look at it with this little hand on the camera there, the little leg down near the bottom of the belt and sitting on the camera. It's perfect. I said, yeah, but look where the hand is at the top, grabbing me in an inopportune place. When I was shooting, I didn't even realise it was just holding onto my shirt. And they laughed and thought it was great and they shared it everywhere. So, you know, safety first. Always make sure you know where their hands are, what they're doing. What can you do? you just got to laugh you know, and you learn from it. Uh, I went back and reshot those pictures and made sure Koala's hands were somewhere else. At the end of the day, photography, wildlife photography or photography in general, it's a wonderful creative way to communicate how you view animals. I view them as beautiful, positive, colourful, you know, and then I use that to support, promote and endorse animal rescue. Photography is fun, it's worthwhile, and it will bring you joy. And you know what? I love my business, but that is still my job. You know, my studio work is what I do for clients as a job. The wildlife stuff is what I, and the charity stuff is what I do for me. And that brings me the greatest joy. So it doesn't matter what your job is. If you're a full-time photographer or you're a teacher or you're a truck driver or an accountant, whatever you do, if photography is your hobby and you just get to do it for the fun and love of it, I think that's the most pure, best form of photography that there is. Um, just a little bit of news. I just want to invite you guys to join my Facebook page if you'd like. It's called Inspire. It's for um, small businesses. Uh, photographers and creatives and it's just an online kind of business page um, so if anyone would like to join that please do and lastly this is where you can find me so if you have any questions about anything today I think we've got a couple of questions in the chat I'll get to as well um, and again thank you for your time and thanks to Tamron for uh, facilitating this and to b &H for having me today and I hope you enjoyed it thank you so much Alex thank you that was awesome my god you got so much information fit into an hour I wish everybody keep, that a bitch. Let's keep an eye on my phone. I was like, oh, come on, you <laughs> don't go over. No, when it's, when it's good, I throw the clock out. I'm like, no, I'll just let her keep talking. If she's going to, she can go. <laughs> we'll be here. No, but you, you are right. We did have some questions. And uh, our first question is from Ava, who, Ava, I hope you screen grabbed that information because Ava was asking uh, uh, about more workshops and would love to learn from, more from you. But that was obviously before we shared your links there. So if you guys didn't have a chance, to screen grab. Obviously, this is going to be archived online. As I have said, you can go to facebook.com backslash BH event space or vimeo.com backslash BH event space to watch this and the rest of our recorded content. But Ava is interested in knowing what do you do for lighting those backdrops, whether it's the, the pure white or pure black? What is your lighting setup like when you're doing the more studio style portraits of the animals? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I was just said, can you put out your contact info again? Do you want me just to screen share and bring that up? Yeah, yeah. We can, uh, um, we'll yeah, that's a great question. One. <laughs> sure. Uh, that's contact info there. So I'll just click there. Um, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, the black backdrop is actually fabric. It's just black stretch fabric. So I don't have any light on that. Just have one light at the front, sometimes two, either side of me. And for the white backdrop, that's a paper roll, great big long paper roll. And I usually have one or two lights at the front next to me, and then just two lights kind of fairly close to that backdrop paper, just as backlight to blow out pure bright white light. So I, I generally can get it pretty white. I then just retouch if there's a bit of fur on the ground or a bit of drool or something. So just minor retouching, but normally I can get the light pretty decent. So I have four lights. White I use three or four, black I use one or two, and none at the back. Um, and if you guys have got that screen, I'll just bring up that one for you as well in case anyone wants that. Um, two. Perfect. Yes, we definitely want to make sure we can. We can find got that. I'll, I'll click out so we can go back to there you go. There you go. All right. Ava also had a question regarding the calendar and greeting card deal. So how do you, or is there any advice that you have for people who are looking to go that route? Because a lot of people, it's like, okay, they want to do photo books. They want to do galleries. They want to sell prints. But nobody really, there's not a lot of information out there. Like, hey, I want to have images on a greeting card or calendar. Um, do you have any advice or is there any, any best route to take for that end goal? Um, calendars you can do yourself and they work quite well if you're doing like a charity project or something like that. So, you know, a good way to possibly do a calendar project yourself is say that it's obviously 12 months in the calendar, go to 12 businesses, 
charge them a fee to have their logo on each page, you know, one page of each of those 12 calendar pages, it might be $100, might be $500, might be $1,000, then use that money to print those calendars. And there's a little bit of profit that you can either keep or give to a charity and then give those calendars to the charity and they sell them at full profit for themselves, you know, so that it can be a self-funding project where it's not costing the charity anything to raise money from them. Um, otherwise, you can basically Google calendar companies and, and some of them let you submit portfolios. So that's a good way to do it. Um, that's how I got my first calendar deal. I submitted pictures and I think it took them like nine months and all of a sudden one day I just got an email saying we just got through all the submissions and we'd like to work with you. So, um, you know, interestingly, um, I've been doing calendars with, calendars with them now for about four or five years. Um, like publishing too with books, if you self-publish, you wear all the costs and you have to sort the distribute the distribution yourself is kind of limited, but you get all the profit. So if the book cost $10 to print and you sell it for 50, you get $40 a book. With calendars with a, and books with publishers who are doing it for you, distribution is massive. They can get into all the stores. I've got calendars or I've had books in Walmart, Target, um, you know, um, Barnes and Noble, like everywhere around the world kind of thing. Um, but you get, you know, an advance up front, then like a dollar per sale. So you kind of have to weigh up, you know, would you, do you want, and I went for distribution because for me, I, not everyone can come to my studio. So having a book or a calendar in someone's home, you know, means that they have a piece of my work, but it's in their, their loud room or wherever. Um, and same with greeting cards companies. There's greeting card companies that you can Google and you can make online submissions um, and you just have to put it out there and then just wait. And, you know, I think I might have contacted initially 10 calendar companies and I heard from one nine months later and I never heard from the rest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I stick, I'm very loyal to brands and businesses who are loyal to me. So I stick with that company now. And in there, I don't do my own calendars because they would cannibalise the published product that they're doing so i don't you know put my own calendars out competing against my printed calendars with the company um, but yeah there's a lot of um, online platforms even with publishing with books some publishers have online submissions where you can submit a concept and and um and put that through to them as well interesting that's, so that's quite online funny. research yeah a bit of google and you'll find the ones that you know and sometimes when i'm at the store I go to the greeting card section and I'll, I'll have my phone and I'll take a picture of the back of the cat. If it's an animal photo, like, you know, a frog holding a flower or something, I'm like, well, I could probably ditch the flower, but do that frog photo. You know, I might photograph that calendar company and, just, and then just go and research if they take submissions. It's another good way to do it too, you know, and same with anything. If you see the calendars in a style that you like, look at who printed them because they're probably, you know, you don't want to go to Tashin publishing who do big photo books generally big books if you're writing a novel it's not a good fit you know you've got to pick the right fit so yeah it's a good way to go and do some market research interesting i feel like we're having like this conversation from like 15 years ago when people actually hit the pavement and you print it out like <laughs> yeah. and you brought them to people and gave them the creative <laughs> and this and that now it's like everyone's like oh i just post on instagram and people will come find me yeah do you know what though like to be honest and, and this is also a thing probably but you know chat gpt and all that sort of stuff i think if right now what the world is craving is authenticity and if you wanted to impress um if there's a calendar company you really want to work with them and you sent a gift basket with some of your pictures and some muffins or some cakes or something you know cupcakes to them that's going to get you noticed more than an online submission like that old school kind of in-person quirky standout stuff um that's unique and different you know that's what people are craving so yeah that old school stuff it wins because it's memorable you know and it gets you remembered and when you're top of mind and they want animal pictures, guess who they're going to call? Totally. I love it. Yeah. We're going to have to have you do a marketing class next time. Forget the. I was just going to say, I do do, I didn't mention this. I didn't want to do a hard sell, but I do do business coaching as well. So I do that. Um, I shoot on weekends and I do that five days a week. So, um, and I have clients all over the world. Quite a lot of them are in the States. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not too bad. I was going to say, I was like, you can't pull the wall over my eyes. I'm like, she's a great <laughs> photographer, but she's got the, because you have some people that are like, all right, they're just purely great photographer and they don't have the business side down and you have mm -hmm. some people it's like and i'm listening to you talk and i'm like she's got a business plan she knows what she's doing. <laughs> thank you <laughs> our last question from steven san marco joining us on vimeo steven wants to know if you've ever taken pictures of wild turkeys here in the united states or anywhere and if you have do you have any tips for taking photos of wild turkeys or if you haven't do you have any tips i haven't photographed wild turkeys i've photographed Turkeys in Australia had a rescue um, and one of them used to jump up and kick people in the head. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> and they're big, big turkeys. Um, but like, I think most of the pictures um, that I've taken of them have been pretty much down at their level. So again, using a big zoom, having a set distance, 
Um, is there a specific behaviour wild turkeys have in America that would be that you'd try and capture? Is there something that I I eat them once a year? That's it. <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to say a lot of your, your tips, I mean, just getting to know your, whatever your subject is, right. Learning about yeah, pretty much. matter and, and yeah. kind of finding out yeah. their nuances and their behaviors where you yeah. can try to predict what they're about to do. Right. Definitely. And maybe Stephen was asking that because they might be quite skittish or they might be hard to photograph. You know, sometimes that patience thing, just sitting, getting them used to you at a distance, like I was with those little rock dassy things sitting a fair way away and they all kept coming out. Um, and then just being ready and, you know, just firing off shots so they're used to the sound of your camera. Um, you know, I don't like to, I don't do any baiting type stuff. I never like for wild hours put food out and what, you know, I just, I, whatever's there is there. I, mean, I don't like to upset the natural order of things, but, um, you know, just knowing where they go to feed, knowing what their routine is. You know, sometimes you have baby birds that live in a burrow and every morning they come out for their morning poop at 6 a.m. So you sit there at 5.30 and you know in half an hour it's going to come out and then go back in and it's gone all day. You know, like just knowing that behavior, um, I think is the biggest thing. And sometimes too, especially with birds, birds in flight, you know, these wild turkeys, they may fly away. Um, you know, birds in flight, it's really hard. It's a very hard genre. And for years, I used to travel and try and photograph birds in flight and just not get it. And then I realized that it's because I was using a lens that wasn't Tamron and it wasn't, it was too slow. The lens I was using just wasn't fast. It was like, a you know, F4 lens or something, um, you know, and I switched to f2.8 lens and it was much faster and I was able to capture birds in flight. So sometimes if you're not, if, you know, your pictures aren't delivering and you're confident that you're doing everything you can, it's your gear. I mean, this is a very addictive hobby. We want bigger, better gear. Bigger, better gear you have, the better success rate you get of having the photo you want in your mind's eye. So sometimes it's too, you know, if you photograph these turkeys and it's not working, you're doing everything, check your gear. You might need to upgrade some stuff. Sorry, but also yay. <laughs> Alex Kern <laughs> said, I need to go shopping. Awesome. <laughs> At BH, go there and get your gear. It's, it's great. Well, and it's real because I, I think we get caught in that that tug of war of like, oh, the gear doesn't matter. And it's like, well, okay, I, I, it doesn't matter, but it does at the same time. Yeah. You're outmatched, especially when you get to photographing wildlife. Um, I had I have a guy who I know, and that's always his thing. It's like, he always like, I don't want to carry heavy gear. But then when I carry, you know, like a 50 to 140, he's like, I don't have the reach. And I'm like, well, you got to decide. You either have to get that mm -hmm. 600 millimeter or you have, you know, because some of the shots are just not obtainable. Wildlife is wildlife and you have to leave yeah. it. And it's, you know, you have to give it space, like you'd said, and not really encroach upon the wildlife and kind of let it do its thing. And at that point, if you don't have gear, you can, gear can only stretch, but so far you have to yeah. up your game at a certain point. Excuse me. And the Tamron um, 100 to, to 600 for the Canon or the also Nikon mount or the E mount for the Sony, the 150 to 500, they're both just for me, um, just enough to handhold. I don't have to, I don't use a tripod. If I use a tripod, I pick up the whole thing and swing it and hit the person next to me in the head because I'm just so reactive, like quick, oh, sorry, you know, like the whole thing's just cumbersome for me. So that's, um, you know, I'm I'm average build. I wouldn't, you know, don't really do weights or anything at the gym. I can just handhold that lens. And to be honest, too, when you're shooting and you're in the zone, you don't really feel it. It'll be later that you'll feel it. <laughs> um, you know, you know, oh, you, you know, oh, I must be standing in that one spot all day like that. Um, but yeah, I don't feel the weight of those lenses, and it's just enough to handhold. There are other brands that are slightly heavier, so you will have to tripod them. But the the Tamron, those big zooms, the massive zooms, um, are exceptional. And like I said, most of those outdoor photos were probably taken on those zoom lenses. You know, yeah. Well, that is a perfect segue to thank Tamron, of course, for hosting today's event and thank Alex, not only for returning to the event space, showing us beautiful images, giving us a ton of information, but we have you up at an ungodly hour of, <laughs> so I want to thank you. You know, it's, it's not easy to, to come on and do these things, especially not when it's at like, you know, Hey, it's not like it's three o'clock in the afternoon. So Alex, huge thank you to you for joining us and for all your wisdom. I hope you guys got all your information there. And if not, rewatch it and watch it and bookmark it and screen grab and watch again until it all becomes second nature like Alex is doing over there. So huge thank you to Alex and Tamron for hosting today's event, to all of our viewers out there for tuning in, getting your questions in. But alas, we are done for the day here at the BH virtual event space. We'll catch y'all next time.